attracted a great deal of attention and controversy, and as such, there's been a follow-up discussion program where the producers and some of the ministers in the program can get together and talk about what the other did wrong. It's called Thy Kingdom Come Follow-Up. That'll be at 11 o'clock tonight in about 90 minutes following the documentary. Good evening. My name's Anthony Thomas. I'm a filmmaker, and as you probably guessed already, I'm British. But I share with many Americans an intense interest in that powerful Christian political movement that seems to have gathered so much momentum in your country through the 80s. The result of my interest was a pair of films which you're about to see in a shortened version. They were made in the fall of 1986, when fundamentalists were winning spectacular victories in the courts, and when Jim Baker's PTL television ministry was the fastest growing phenomenon in religious broadcasting. Here then is the first of those films. and tired of hearing about all of the radicals and the perverts and the liberals and the leftists and the communists coming out of the closets it's time for God's people to come out of the closets out of the churches and change America we must do it during the past eight years a powerful Christian political movement has gathered strength in America we established this nation on the Judeo-Christian ethic, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Mr. Khomeini is not ashamed of his Muslim state. Why should we be ashamed of something 10 million worlds better, a Judeo-Christian state, that we do in fact have? More than any other event, it was this rally in Dallas in 1980 that marked the movement's triumphant entry into the mainstream of American politics. Now, I know this is a nonpartisan gathering, and so I know that you can't endorse me, but I only brought that up because I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. Seven years and several campaigns later, the movement has its own people in office at local, state and federal levels. And they now have the confidence to field a candidate for the presidency of the United States, Pat Robertson, a television evangelist. At the rate we're heading now, by the year 2075, the population of the Western democracies will only be four and a half percent of all the people in the world. What we are doing is committing racial suicide. What do these people really believe? And what does their message mean for the rest of America? And indeed, for the rest of the world? The religious roots of the movement go back to the folk Christianity of the American frontier, with its belief in the literal truth of the Bible, fundamentalism, and its emphasis on an emotional, personal relationship with God. For generations, this was the religion of poor folk and country folk. Most of these country congregations were Baptist, but by the turn of the century, other denominations appeared that laid even greater emphasis on that emotional moment of personal salvation, the so-called born-again experience.
This is a fundamentalist church today, but these are no longer country people. In 1980, this church was founded by 13 families. Now they number 11,000. Who are these people, and why have they been drawn to this faith in such numbers? Well, I had been struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction for at least 10 years, and I chose to leave the children. They were better off without me, I felt. There was no hope. All I was doing was making them suffer more. And so I felt that if I just kind of ran away and let the progressiveness of the, you know, the illness of alcoholism claim another victim kind of thing. And so I, I just left to die. I was raped the first time when I was five, the fifth time when I was 16. Once my mother was even in the same room there. And one time was supposedly by a man of God. Another time was by my dad's best friend. I had a nervous breakdown then and went through six psychiatrists before the sixth one finally decided that she could probably help me. <laughs> I was making very good salary, but there was always something lacking. And I knew there was something much more important than just making the mortgage payment and the the car payments and just going to work every day, nine to five, making a living and trying to raise a child. Before I met Jesus, I felt empty and I felt hurt and lost in that void. Oh, there was a, an emptiness. There was such an emptiness in my life. I've been on drugs for 20 years. I'm 32 years old. It's, you know, it's been one drug or another. I was strung on heroin for five years, strung out on speed altogether for about six or seven years. I was strung out on LSD back in the 60s. I took it every day for two years. I mean, anything that was available for me to alter my consciousness, I would take it. I was raised in a nominal Christian home. That is, we attended church. My mother was very faithful to that. My father, uh, my dad, was not a born-again Christian. He was an alcoholic, as a matter of fact, and living in a divided home, my mother being a Christian and my dad being an alcoholic, there was this uh, tearing sense. And uh, I was at a place of total despair. And I began to cry out, God, if you're there, if there is a God, I want to know you. And I said, Jesus, if, if you're real, I'll give my life to you. Glory. You know, the great thing about our family is that we're all different. <laughs> Amen. But there is unity yes. in our diversity. Oh, yes. My hand and my foot are different, but they belong to the same body. Amen. And as long as my hand and my foot are coordinated by my head, this body of mine is a wonderful thing. And here tonight, I'm believing that the Holy Spirit is going to allow the hand and the foot and the mouth just to begin to speak and to minister and to heal, coordinated by the head. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Ginger, I want you to describe to me the moment when you were born again, when Jesus entered your life. What happened? I actually felt the presence of Jesus just put his arms around me. And I heard an audible voice telling me that he loved me and that he had always loved me. I poured the liquor down the commode, uh, 
flushed a few other things, uh, got rid of some magazines that uh, were laying around the house, and from that point on, never had a desire ever to return to any of that. It was like somebody shot me, and I just shot out of that seat and ran down the aisle, and they took me back in a room, and they said, what do you want? And I said, well, I don't know. I, I, want, I want God in my life. The cleansing of Jesus' blood over my life at that point was, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain that. It was, it was just stupendous. For the first time in my life, I felt clean. I didn't feel dirty and abused and ashamed of being alive. And uh, still had a long way to go from there, but that was the start. The Bible says God has not given to you the spirit of fear, but of power. Say he's given me power. 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 And love. Power. And a sound mind. Power. I'm not crazy anymore. I'm not crazy. Praise God. Tell me what you've learned about God's love for you. He's my father. And uh, to me that's something very precious. I never, I never had a father as far as a father image. My father abused me, physically beat me whenever I was growing up. He brought that hope that there were answers to the questions that we had. There, you know, things were going to turn out all right. We were not going to be impoverished forever. Uh, that indeed our lives, our marriage would come together and solidify in a way that it never had before. And we knew that we had that someone to turn to. What does he give to you? Peace. Love. A sense of purpose. And well-being. Well-being. He's given me a sound mind that psychiatrists have said that I never would have. And he's healed me of hatred and bitterness that I've carried for 35 years. He's, uh, he's just all I need. When I look into your holiness, oh, look into his holiness, gaze into your love, experience his loveliness. fundamentalist in the sense that you believe in the literal truth of every word of the Bible? Most definitely, I do. So that's you know, the Bible's been so the number one bestseller for all of time? All times. Amen. I don't know what a fundamentalist believes, but I believe in the Bible. <laughs> every word of it. Every word of it. The creation story is actually how God did create the world, bring it into existence, that man is not a is, is, is not a mutation of biological form but actually a creation of God and so yes on the, on, at that score I am and would be considered a fundamentalist there's verses directly addressing alcoholism drugs prostitution pornography any any area of concern that faces man is 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 there we have to have someone who has you know 
a higher power that can answer these complex questions that are in our world today. Because without the Lord, there's no hope. We're living in an age where we thought for a long time that we had all the answers through technology, through prosperity, uh, all the things that the, were the good life that we all had worked for, uh, my parents, myself, uh, have sort of been taken away from us because we're finding out that the, the, the lives that we, the jobs that we gave our lives to uh, were shattering. Uh, they were closing up. Plants, factories, companies have shut down and there hasn't been a real answer to that. And the, the foundation that people had based their lives on was slowly cr crumbling around about them. I know our children, you know, are living in, a, in a, a time where it's so different from the time that we lived because we didn't live with nuclear war hanging over our heads. We didn't live with the fact that maybe one day we'd be here and tomorrow we'd be blown up, we'd be burned up. But that's, that's what our children have lived with. We've got mother against father, you know, all these divorces. We've got all these suicides. Child abuse, alcoholism, drug addiction. Um, it's just, these days are just like Sodom and Gomorrah. The days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The deep concerns of ordinary troubled Christians have not gone unheard. There are powerful men in the land who have listened and offered a solution. A solution at the right wing of American politics. President Reagan almost fights a battle alone as vacillating Congress sets and will do nothing while nation after nation stands in peril. None are more strident than the TV evangelists. Don't make any mistake, you're being hunted down by those who are essentially or atheists. Men like presidential candidate Pat Robertson. Religion. They hate Christianity. They hate the Bible because the Bible's the truth and they don't like the truth. And it's like, you know, you're like birds with a hunter coming after you. And that's what's happening. We take the blame. We have been asleep. We were told politics and religion don't mix and we swallowed it. If we live in unsavory times, and we do, we must penetrate every area of our society. Yes, even the political area. God is raising up men that will uh, be righteous men in the earth. Uh, you mentioned Pat Robertson. He is a close personal friend of, of mine and ours. And we believe that he is a, a very godly man. I pray for him and I pray that God will bless him and his endeavors. I see God raising up men to take offices uh, all throughout the land. Not just uh, major offices, but offices at the grassroots level. The state steadily is attempting to do something that few states other than the Nazis and the Soviets have attempted to do, namely to take the children away from the parents and to educate them in a philosophy which is amoral, anti-Christian, humanistic, and to show them a collectivist philosophy which will ultimately lead toward Marxist, socialist, communistic type of ideology. Well, I took my son out of public school because of the humanistic viewpoint that they teach him. Uh, God says we're to train up our children, not the government. And the stuff that they're training them up to be is almost like communism. Pat Robertson takes an in-depth look at earth-shaking biblical prophecies being fulfilled right now. Startling events foreshadowing the end of the world as we know it. Pat Robertson confronts these alarming questions in his new tape teaching series on Bible prophecy. The Revelations talks about when the moon becomes red. Right. Now, more times than not, when it's a full moon, y'all can go out and see a red moon. When the sun becomes black, more times than not, we are getting more and more eclipses. When brother turns against brother, when all the countries turn against the homeland, everybody's against Israel right now. We want to see this nation come to Christ. And after it comes to Christ, there's going to be many other nations that come to Christ, with the end result being the Jewish nation for Israel to come to Christ. And that will intimately bring the return of Jesus back on this earth. That's our goals. That's where I see Church on the Rock moving towards. Does Russia play a prophetical role in the last days? Yes. God himself will effect a smashing defeat against the Soviet troops and actually destroy five-sixths of the Soviet troops upon the mountains of Israel. 
not the U.S., God will destroy Russia. You are going to stand before that God one of these days and answer to God all night. Television evangelism burgeoned into a multi-billion dollar industry as cable and satellite vastly increased access to the nation's screens. Today, the evangelists claim daily audiences of over 40 million. Many people were unaware of the power and scale of the phenomenon until a major scandal turned the spotlight on Jim and Tammy Baker, forcing them to relinquish their PTL television ministry to a competitor, Jerry Falwell, amidst accusations and counter-accusations. I see the greed. I, I see the self-centeredness. I, I see the avarice that brought them down. And now, here they come, our host and hostess, Jim and Tammy Baker! Only a short while before the scandal broke, we learnt about the spectacular growth of television evangelism from the man who was then running the fastest growing ministry in the business. I often tell people I think I'm one of the first people that, uh, that was actually called of God to do television. I feel a call from God to do what I do. The PTL Television Network presents Jim and Tammy. This phenomena is really, I think, a phenomena of God and a sovereign move of God and the hunger of people for God and for the supernatural, for healing, for a God who can help them, a God who can solve problems, a real God. And the old saying was, uh, you know, find a need and fill it and you'll be successful. I think the church today and especially the church world that I live in, is, is filling a great void and a great need in people's lives. Why is there this hunger and void in America? We've had everything. Rich kids are on drugs. You know, they, they've been given everything. They have lovely cars, they have lovely homes, and their fathers make fine money, and they give them wonderful things, and yet they go out and become drug addicts. And, and they try drugs, they try alcohol, they try sex, and... When it's all wiped out and you've had it all, you know, life falls apart. You know, and then there's AIDS we can't cure, uh, herpes that we cannot cure, and, and drug addiction that's, that's killing people. They need help. And we realize that materialism has not solved any problems. And so they're hungry. They're hungry for something outside of themselves, for the supernatural, for a God that's alive, a God that works. And this thing works. down in history as one of the great visionaries of all time, but more importantly, he is a doer, not just a thinker. Nine years ago, this was an abandoned industrial park, and today there's over $150 million worth of completed construction and literally billions of dollars of new projects on the drawing boards. We have 2,300 acres, but we have only developed 350 acres, so we have plenty of room for the expansion of the dreams that God has given to Jim Baker. One of the major construction projects now is to construct our new six-lane boulevard. You know, last year, 1.3 million people went to the Holy Land, but we had 4.9 million people come to Heritage USA. And so sometimes the traffic backs up as far as six miles down the interstate. So we're working on that. In fact, our new entryway has three five-story high waterfalls, plus uh, water shooting between the pools. You'll actually drive underwater to come onto the grounds of Heritage USA. Why should we who serve God be less creative than those who don't serve God? I say if you serve the Creator, you should surely be more creative. And we should use the modern technology. And we've taken the old-fashioned campground and we've brought it up to date. Most 
Christian campgrounds have a swimming pool. We happen to have one of the largest in the country. It's the longest wave pool ever built. We have duplexes and triplexes and single home units, and uh, we have rental units and some condominium projects. So it's a $1.5 billion construction project over the next few years. So many parents want to see their children live in a drug-free, alcohol-free, smoke-free environment. And when they come to Heritage USA, it seems they have found it. Now, ahead of us is the new Heritage Grand Hotel. We have 500 wonderful rooms, and we've just completed a new tower that will be open shortly with an additional 500 rooms. It's actually a $63 million project. Jim Baker understood the yearnings of ordinary, troubled Americans. Main Street, USA, the centerpiece of his heritage theme park. It was, and still is, hermetically sealed and artificially lit from a blue concrete sky. Here people can still enjoy the sidewalk cafes and benches because nothing of the real America intrudes. Neither the harsh extremes of the Carolina climate, nor traffic, there's one parked vintage car, nor the addicts, nor the street bums, nor the muggers, nor the litter. This is a synthetic main street of folk memory, satisfying a yearning for an America that never was, and where the only reality is the hard sell. The, the Christian hard have been rewritten to teach children biblical principles. For instance, in the Three Bears and the Ministry, Goldilocks gets saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's an armor that the kids can actually dress up in and play in. It fits about a three to a ten year old. And then these are good alternatives too. Here's David and Goliath. It comes packaged with a little Bible story tape and a book. You'd have a good time playing with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. There is a difference between what's really real in the world of pretend and what's real is the Bible and everything in it is true and we can believe it. So the children learn both biblical principles and relationship. That this is the, the newest doll to our family. Oh, this is Grace and she's called our pro-life doll. She comes packaged with a song about abortion. is really really cute we find these dolls really minister to the kids that have them and if you have a child that's afraid to go to bed at night by themselves when they have one of these dolls it really becomes a companion for them inside the christian fantasy land and over the airwaves the pressure to buy to give to pledge was relentless and although we've got hundreds and thousands that are so faithful and god bless you god bless you for your faithfulness still there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, who were not faithful, who made the pledge and for some reason or another haven't sent it in. And when we count on that, and it doesn't come in, everything, everything suffers. We are even having a hard time meeting the payroll right now, and the people that we have working for PTL have families too, they have bills too. 
Jim Baker's running costs exceeded two million dollars a week. But he and his wife Tammy knew their congregation and how to reach them. I get so tired sometimes of the worry of it. This baby that I'm holding in my hands is one of the first babies that has been saved through the outreach of the people that love home ministry. 1986 was Jim Baker's year of good works. Inside the fantasy land, building suddenly started on this hostel for unmarried mothers, another for street people, and this fairy tale home for disabled children. All three projects timed for simultaneous dedications on the 4th of July. This is our dining room where we seat 10 for dinner and also our beautiful Christmas tree where we have that has been put up for um, Christmas City. This is our front room that we have our beautiful glass doors. And this is our living room where we have a beautiful fireplace and also our baby grand piano which my mother and sisters asked for when Jim built the house. We're on my way to my room right now where I asked Jim for my sliding glass doors and also for my tower that he put in which is only one of two of the towers in the whole house. The children in Kevin's house, there'll be eight of them, but they're not quite here yet because of that my mom and dad do not have the license yet. They're working on that right now, and when they're ready, the people are going to give them it. To this day, Kevin Whittam is the only disabled child ever to have lived at Kevin's home. We're on our way to the playroom where we have a beautiful old-fashioned radio and we also have our organ that was donated to us, our beautiful rocking horse that a lot of the kids that come over like to ride. How old are you, Kevin? I'm 18. And I looked in that little face and I said, Kevin, I'm going to build a house for you. And I'm going to build a house for kids like you here at Heritage USA and I'm going to call it Kevin's house. I appear on PTL um, whenever they want me, once or twice a month. And are you under contract to them? Um, well, yeah. Um, basically the contract is um, that I stay here and um, I do kind of, um, things when, when they want me spots. And they also help me out with going to school. What sort of spots do you do? Um, whatever they want. It's usually for advertisements of Kevin's house to me raise more money, donations, and just, you know, things like that. Have you raised a lot of money for PTL? Oh, I, I'd like to think we have. Kevin, you have a chance to talk to our PTL partners. What do you want to say to them today? Just send in what you can to help them as a ministry. They wouldn't ask if they didn't need it. And maybe get tired of hearing them ask for money and stuff but if they don't ask sometimes either partners won't give so they have to ask what does it feel like though to be living by yourself in a huge house like this i kind of like it i guess it's it's home the house was built in 32 days which is very fast for a house of this magnitude and size. Did they have to build it so quickly? Yeah, they wanted to get that done by the time 
4th of July came around so they could do three big and major dedications to the house, which was very beautiful. Was that the only reason? I think they might have been a little bit worried that I might um, die before the house was done if they didn't build it fast. What was more important, you or the 4th of July? Uh, I think the 4th of July. Give me the ammunition. Don't make me beg and plead. Please. Give me the ammunition. I've got the soldiers. I've got the troops. I've got the weapons. No figures are broadcast to show what percentage of their income the television evangelists devote to good work. To build Liberty Godparent homes for little pregnant girls. That's why I'm asking you to help me, because I cannot do this alone. But when it comes to the pitch, good works are always top priority, and hearts are touched. Number two, Jerry is a faith partner. I'll give you $15 a month. Of Few people understood this better than Jim Baker. Well, Kevin's Club is specifically for young people that are seriously debilitated, and um, we request a $1,000 donation for that, and that goes towards the upkeep of Kevin's house, where these children the evangelists have turned television into a two-way medium. As the appeals went out on Jim Baker's PTL network, the responses flooded back in from the needy, the troubled, and the persuaded. Around the clock, these volunteers were ready to listen, pray, share, and sell. Tommy also has some materials on salvation that I want to send you, and also some essays that we have that will help you with this homosexual situation that you're in. Could I send those to you? Great. Lord, bless this mother that's called with concern for her daughter. Lord, give her wisdom and guidance, Lord, in helping her, her child. What age are you? Yes, ma'am. You're 95 years old. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Lily. He needs a social life that's founded in Christ. He needs his financial obligations met. He needs, dear Lord, his spiritual blessings, the joy of the Lord to flood his heart. And we thank you to do it tonight for him. Okay, whenever you die, Lily, you don't have to worry anymore because if you died tonight, then you would be with the Lord in heaven. And he already has a, a mansion built for you on the streets of gold. Alcohol. If the TV camera has made the electronic church possible, the telephone and above all the computer have made it profitable and powerful. Give me your name. And your address? Your city? All right, can I have your zip code? Okay, and how old are you, Tommy? Great. Okay, and your phone number? Here is a way to target mail, to acquire, sort, store, and retrieve increasing amounts of information, information that can be put to political use. On the outskirts of Washington is the largest political mailing organization in America. For years, conservatives used to complain about the bias in the media and that we weren't uh, getting our message out and they weren't talking about our issues. Richard Vigory, president and founder. But through direct mail, we were able to bypass the monopoly that the left had on the microphones of this country and go into America's homes uh, by the millions and talk about our candidates, our issues, and our causes. We'll probably mail about 75 million letters each of the next two years. And in almost all of these letters, we'll be asking for some action. They'll be saying a vote's going to come in Congress next week or next month and send this postcard to your congressman or call your senator on the phone, uh, write a letter to the newspaper, uh, attend a meeting, take some kind of action. And, and that's one thing that's unique about direct mail. It is uh, a, an advertising vehicle that allows people to get personally involved in, in a cause. Direct mail and religious broadcasting have been our means of making an end run to the minds of the American people. Tim LaHaye selected 33 top TV evangelists 
including Jerry Falwell and Jim Baker, to serve on the executive board and committee of the American Coalition for Traditional Values, another right-wing pressure group. To awaken them to their responsibility, it's unbelievable how many born-again Christians... These Washington-based operatives are the men who have steered the TV evangelists into politics. I'm here to bring you greetings from President Reagan, a president who is proud repeatedly and publicly to contest his faith in Jesus Christ. But it is this man, seen at a rally for television evangelist Jimmy Swaggart, who claims to have had the original inspiration. I have a letter in my hand, dear Jimmy. As you begin this new phase, you have my best wishes for continued success. And again, congratulations, sincerely, Ronald Reagan. Thank you. About 10 years ago, uh, in one of these meetings with conservative leaders, I made the statement that the theologically conservative Christians were the largest tract of virgin timber on the political landscape. And we began to focus on which of them would be most uh, amenable to becoming active politically. For three years, Morton Blackwell was the link man between President Reagan and the conservative Christians. He now heads the Leadership Institute, which grooms right-wing applicants for business, industry, and the government bureaucracies. And of the whole lot, it appeared to us that the most likely was Dr. Jerry Falwell, and so a group was organized uh, to go down and meet with Dr. Falwell in Lynchburg. One of the people who went to one of the conservative leaders was my friend Mr. Paul Wyrick, who uh, told Dr. Falwell on the, on the spot, he says, Sir, I believe there is out there a moral majority waiting to be organized. And Dr. Falwell said, Hey, I like that uh, term, and that is the name he uh, adopted for his uh, lobbying arm of, of his ministry. Uh, other conservative religious leaders, particularly religious broadcasters, began to say, hey, lightning did not strike Jerry Falwell, and uh, he has had a more successful ministry as a result of his speaking out on public policy questions. There's no reason why I can't go and do likewise. And so they did in large numbers, and the success has just been phenomenal. Anthony, I will tell you that there, it is easy to calculate. Over a billion dollars this year, one billion dollars, uh, voluntarily contributed to conservative religious leaders in 1986 in the United States. Easy to count it up. Senators, congressmen, pastors, educators, and thousands of students from all across the United States join Dr. Jerry Falwell in this special presentation of I Love America. Political pressure on ordinary, concerned Christians is relentless. The Heritage Foundation building in Washington houses yet another group, Gary Jarman's Christian Voice. Christian Voice has brought political technology to the church. Uh, we've developed practically all of the uh, most useful methods that are now applied in Christian political activism, uh, such as the concept of organizing church committees uh, for political action, doing scorecards on the candidates, uh, and so on. So I think we've, we've sort of been at the cutting edge of bringing the political technology into being and applying it to the church. Gary Jarman has managed to reduce politics to a dozen or so moral issues which are listed under pictures of the opposing candidates. Those who adopt liberal positions on censorship or abortion are characterized as pro-pornography and pro-abortion, therefore immoral. Past. We, but we do stack the deck in the favor of the guy we're supporting. Why? Very simple. We know that the people we're handing these out to are people who also agree with us already. They're pretty much... Jarman's real skill has been to push the Christian agenda beyond religious issues into straight right-wing politics, making the death penalty, federal tax cuts, nuclear armament, and Star Wars Christian and moral. The church is ideal in that, of course, you don't have to call a meeting and ask people to attend this rally or come here this political candidate. They're already there. They attend it once, twice, maybe three times a week. So it's just a matter of you have the ready-made audience uh, that is highly ideological, of course, because we're talking about a religious context now in which this political debate occurs. And so all you have to do is plug into it. Since we got involved, Christians like you and myself, and the so-called religious right, trying to take and recapture our country, as Jerry Falwell says, for Christ, trying to turn America around back to godliness, 
Buddy, I'm gonna tell you something. We've made ourselves a pile of enemies. But I'll tell you one thing. It's time we Christians stood up for what's right. And let me remind you again... In the heart of a Florida pine forest is one of the many thousands of churches that the Christian Voice Organization has plugged into. This country is ours. That's why. Jeff Byrne said, pastor of this Baptist church. has in God we trust is our slogan. This country was founded on a belief in Almighty God. In this 1986 Florida election campaign, Christian Voice focused its attack on the Democratic candidate for the governorship, Steve Padgett. Steve Padgett opposes capital punishment, supports abortion, supports homosexuality, he op opposes voluntary prayer in the school, he supports pornography. Uh, Pastor Byrne said and his Christian foot soldiers were ordered into battle alongside the battalions fighting for Padgett's Republican challenger. Bob Martinez. And Bob Martinez is just the opposite on the issues. Martinez is a Catholic, but in this case, politics come before theology. He's a Republican nominee and a real fine man, and by the way, I might add, he's a Christian man. So that's what it basically does. Our report card simply, very succinctly, sums up the, the moral issues that this nation has got to be concerned with. So we're going to take these and pass them out in, in malls to people, put, place them on cars for the most part. We've already used almost one million in Florida alone, which has caused quite a stir across our state. We've used about 500,000 at this point in Georgia. And these, uh, again, I think are on a good guideline for intelligent voting. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd guide us, direct us, and use us as we go in, and, and we really do battle for you, so to speak, and the battle for America. I pray that you bless, Father, everything that we do, and I pray that you get glory out of it. Use us now as we get out and, and just pass leaflets out everywhere and put them on cars and talk to people, and we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. Politicians may gain when ordinary troubled Americans are persuaded it is their Christian duty to support nuclear armament, tax cuts, contra aid and Star Wars, but the church is made to suffer. Christian is finally pitted against Christian. Excuse me. Uh, do the people in the We camp surely are. I'd just like to let you know that uh, there are a lot of good Christian people that are adamantly opposed Very to what you're doing. To I am sick and tired of the abortionist, the pro-gay, the weirdo, the perverted mind taking away our rights. Better. Yes. Uh, well, it's time that we stood up for what we, we believe That's in. That's right. And the majority of Americans today are pro biblicist people. And That's we right. are going to take a Some stand. Some of the people you oppose are good Christian people. Are they too? Christian people? Tell me who. I didn't say I opposed any of them. Are you we telling don't me they don't How can you tell me they're not? The how can you say that? Good about Christian how people should issues. decide for themselves. We're which giving them the Christian choice. You're right. They We're telling them. For. You're you know, trying to ten influence years, them. Ten years ago, them. people did know how you. a candidate. Are you Republican? Considering that's, doesn't no, matter. No, because I want to know matter. why all of the Democrats refuse to answer, but all the Republicans have. Well, you'll see that Betty Castor has has an answer there. Of course, we researched her. That's the only one on the whole page. Well, the Georgia Democratic Party responded really well. This is the Florida. This is what we're talking. This was on my part. Well, we have the local races. Document. We're I don't, know. Some Do you think, don't you think this is a form of propaganda? Our issues were ignored in the political debate. By bringing those issues up and rating members of Congress on them and educating the voters about them, we have forced congressmen and forced senators and, and uh, many to begin to debate our issues <clears throat> and address those issues. And we all know that in politics, he who can uh, frame the debate has got half the battle won. Tampa, Florida, election night. Bob Martinez, the candidate backed by Christian Voice. It's been a good one. We wouldn't be happy without y'all's help. We're real pleased. Real pleased. Bob Martinez takes the governorship. He is only the second Republican to win this office since the Civil War. I am so thrilled. We're looking now for 88. It's imperative that a real, true conservative president be elected. And 
an army of candidates for every office in the country. I think we have yet to see really the, the full political muscle of potential political muscle of this vast array of Christians out there. I think the next 10 years are going to be far more successful for the conservatives, for the Christians, than the, than the last 10 years. And as President Reagan says, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let me tell you something else about the character of God. If necessary, God would raise up a tyrant, a man who might not have the best ethics to protect the freedom interests of the ethical and the godly. Since that film was first shown, it's been a bad year for television evangelists. Jim Baker is now under investigation for possible mail, wire and tax frauds and could face federal charges for raising money under false pretenses on a number of his projects, including Kevin's house. Kevin is still the only disabled person ever to have lived there and he may be homeless on May the 1st following a successful suit to evict him. Jimmy Swaggart, who was thought to be a prime mover in exposing the sex scandal that originally brought Baker down, has had the tables turned on him by another preacher who photographed Swaggart coming out of a Louisiana motel with a prostitute. That other television evangelist, Pat Robertson, appears to have failed to carry the Christian right vote and secure the Republican nomination. Exit polls indicate that the majority of born-again Christians are backing George Bush. In our second film, we switch perspectives, from the overview down to the solid rock bed. It's a portrait of a particular church in a particular place, which for me raises all sorts of questions, not only about the politics of the movement, but perhaps even its Christianity as well. Mount Vernon, Dallas, Texas. Weekly Bible Class, hosted by Ruth Hunt, widow of oil billionaire H.L. Hunt, and stepmother of Willie and Nelson Bunker Hunt, who in 1979 made a grab for the entire world's silver market. Okay, darling, I'll turn it over to you now. Sweetest, most wonderful Bible teacher in the whole world. We're so blessed. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Would you please open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, to the 43rd chapter. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. God said, I did that with every single one of you. I decided what your color scheme would be, so that your hair blends with your eyes, you know, if you don't change your hair, and your skin, everything is exactly according to my design for you. I wanted you to appear in a certain fashion. Mrs. Hunt, something that seems central to the faith of so many people here in Dallas, but not to my own, is fundamentalism. Are Christians really required to believe that every word of the Bible is literally true? Let me ask you something. Were it not true, every 
word in the Bible, were it not true, who could we feel would be knowledgeable enough to say just what is not true? One person would say this is not true. Someone else would say that is not true. And someone else would say this is not true. You could end up with nothing is true. The Bible means nothing. Everyone would have different ideas about what is or is not true. Where would you draw the line? It is the inspired word of God. So you'd be proud to be called a fundamentalist? Yes. Oh, indeed I am. Is First Baptist Church of Dallas very important to you? I wish everybody, I wish there were a church like ours on, in every neighborhood in the world. I do. There's something about what you receive there. You step inside the sanctuary and you have a feeling it just engulfs you. You just want to drop to your knees. You feel the Lord is so close. The title of the sermon is The Awakened Church. Dallas. They call it the buckle on the Bible belt. It has the largest quota of millionaires, the worst crime rate, and one of the severest poverty rates in any American city. Yet Dallas could also be described as the most Christian place on this earth. It has the highest proportion of paid up church members in any city, anywhere. And the majority embrace the most conservative form of Christianity. To find out what kind of world the Christian right is creating for itself and wishes to impose on the rest of America, we must begin here at the very center of their richest and most powerful stronghold. First Baptist Church of Dallas. With 26,000 members, this is the largest church in the largest Protestant denomination in America. Dr. W. A. Criswell, pastor since 1944. The fourth, not only continuing steadfastly in the doctrine. If anyone has a right to be called the vicar of Dallas, this is he. But also continuing steadfastly in taste cross you cut. It was Dr. Criswell who officiated at the marriage between fundamentalism and mainstream politics at that historic rally in Dallas seven years ago. We welcome you to this one of the greatest assemblies in the 20th century, Governor Ronald Reagan. Thank you, Dr. Kurzweil. Thank you. Our church has five blocks. 
in the downtown heart of this city and in the most priceless portion of downtown Dallas. There's not another corporation that has that much property in the heart of this city. But God has given to us in our First Baptist Church, and I use it for the kingdom of God and love doing it. Just like this office in which you now stand, this is no poor man's place, as you can see. When one thinks of Christ's ministry, one remembers that the disciples were sent out without shoes, without a staff, without money. Then one thinks of this ministry, with its resources of millions. Their means of propagating the gospel were with what they had, which was maybe bare feet and bare hands. But today, in the modern church, you don't go out with bare feet and bare hands. There's no virtue in being poor. If there was, all of us ought to be poor so we'd get to heaven. I'd like to share something personal, because I believe that the Gospels are telling me to let go of all my material possessions before I can call myself a Christian. I'm incapable of making that commitment, and it sets up a conflict. Do you have any similar conflict to deal with? I think you have a wrong idea of the Gospel. who is a Christian will have a tendency to be prospered. I tell the young men who are capable in the church, make money, succeed. First Baptist is a city within a city. It has its own nurseries, primary school, secondary school and university. Ministries for teenagers, businessmen, married couples, divorcees. And all this within a church. Square feet of space in this vast complex is used for educational purposes, spiritual purposes, soul winning purposes, ecclesiastical purposes, worship purposes. It's a glorious commitment. If we use the measure of church membership, Dallas is probably the most Christian city in the world. Yes. Well, over half the population attend churches regularly. Yes. And in that same Christian city, there's the highest crime rate That's in the right. United States, the highest That's divorce right. rate. That's right. Why should the most Christian city also be the most criminal? You have thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in, in this city that do not go to any church, that are not Christian. And in that circumference, you find that high crime rate. So all the criminals are non-church members. Where you have a great many poor black people and a great many poor Mexican people in a in a context like that you're going to have a high crime rate and we have many black people and many Hispanic people who are poor very poor who live in the city of Dallas no hay Dios tan grande como tú. This congregation is also part of the First Baptist community, but they worship in a different church, on the other side of the freeway.
Aleluya. Praise God. Hermano, ver a paz en el nombre del Señor. Aleluya. Gloria a Dios. Aleluya. Criswell's First Baptist is an imperial church. It has established a hold over the Dallas ghettos by adopting no less than 26 ethnic churches. In exchange for desperately needed buildings, furnishings, car parks, even preachers' salaries, First Baptist seems to have bought a message that faithfully echoes the right-wing orthodoxy of the Mother Church. And it's a shame, it's a shame when slop looks good to God's people. All right. I'll tell you what happens when slop looks good. When slop looks good, people start believing that homosexuality is an alternate lifestyle. All right. When slop looks good, one person can take prayer out of public school. Uh, secular humanists would have you to believe that this world is set up for you to do your own thing to please yourself. Yes. God says, no, no. <laughs> if you get caught up in lifting yourself up, God says, I'll cut you down. Amen. Pastor, why do the different racial groups within First Baptist worship in separate buildings? Why can't they worship together as one community? Birds of a feather flock together. People of a like background sort of gravitate toward each other, and they don't mix very well. Let's take the black. It seems to me that he is by nature responsive to God. He sings. They'll have preaching all day long. They seemingly never tire of praising the Lord God. If birds of a feather flock together, leopards certainly don't change their spots. When the Supreme Court introduced the first anti-segregation rulings in 1954, Criswell urged state legislators to resist. Integrationists, he told them, were infidels, dead from the neck up. In our churches, Negroes could never excel, and it's a kindness to them to send them to churches of their own. It was against this background that he started to put money into separate ethnic churches 30 years ago. Criswell held out against black membership of the Mother Church until 1968, when he decided to put the best possible face on what had now become inevitable. They respond to the gospel, the black man, the black people do. Now let's take these brown Hispanic people. It seems to me that they are by nature conservative. They're family people. They love their children. They look upon promiscuity and, and moral compromise with abhorrent. The work of the chapels is very, very, very blessed. We have our inner city chapel, and that is a ministry to street people, the flotsam and jetsam of humanity, people who have found themselves cast out of society because they are drug addicts, they are drunks, they are prostitutes, they are pickpockets, they're everything that belongs to a lower level of living in life. Now that ministry is to those street people. I pray God that some of you wake up today in the hog pen of life. You may be in the hog pen and it stinks and it smells horrible. You may say, I hate it. Hate it. And you may hate getting in line time and time again. You may say, man, this life stinks. Some people say, well, hell's on earth, everybody. 
so you don't know what you're talking about. Listen to me! Tell it, Listen tell to it. Me. Come on. Hell is real. Real. And there are people in the world that are too intellectual for that. Oh, man, that's foolish! I wonder how many people today burning in hell this very hour, burning in hell right now, never thought it was real until they went there. God is not going to send somebody back to prove to you hell is real. And you die without Jesus Christ, you go to hell. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> how many of you excited about this magnificently beautiful rainy day? Less than a mile away from Dr. Criswell's downtown right. mission, lay preacher and professional motivator Zig Ziglar delivers a very different message in a televised Bible class held inside the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church. In Psalms uh, 68, 19, we read, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, tells us in Proverbs, in the 21st chapter, in the 5th verse, he says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. But those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. God says here, go get it, possess it. When you have God on your side, then you will have good success. Zig Ziglar's Gospel of Success seems to raise a frightening and blasphemous corollary. Don't you think that he would repent and say, Oh God, forgive me and save my soul? Not so. You see, Judas was a fake. And we have fakes today. If wealth and prosperity are a sign of God's approval, is sickness and poverty a sign of his disapproval, for which the poor must be made to feel guilty? Are you faking it? Do you kiss the Lord with your lips, but your hearts are far away from Him? Are you faking it before God? God knows it. You may fake Brother Bobby. You may fake Brother Roy. You may fake Brother Van. You may fake Mama. You may fake Daddy. You may even fake your wife. You may even fake your husband. But you don't fake They have to sit there from 6.30 to 8.30 before they can get something to eat. It's warm inside, right? But the thing is, they have to be preached to for two to three hours before they can eat. What they're doing is just pressuring people. That's why I've known a lot of people that have gone out there only when they have to, only when they really need food. But you get a feeling that if you don't listen to their religion, you're not going to eat, you know? And eating is, some, is the number one thing. That's what you're there for. But I feel that when you're up there, you're eating under duress. We give thousands of dollars a year in food to the people to whom we minister in those chapels. It is a way to help them. And in helping them, they listen to us as we make appeal for the gospel. In your various chapels, you're reaching people who might have wished to change the society. Is that your ambition, to win them over to conservative Christianity? I think it's our only hope. I don't think, for example, a man can be a good Christian and be a materialistic, secular communist. I think they're diametrically opposite. I think Marx and Lenin are the opposite of Christ and John and Paul. And when we win these people to the Lord Jesus Christ, in addition to us, is a subtraction from them. You're not going to have a communist movement where the people are devout and Christian. You just not. I don't think so. Attention, salute, pledge. The new generation of Criswell's people make the triple pledge to America, the Bible, and the cross of Jesus before beginning the day at the First Baptist Academy. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart, that I might not sin against God.
Attention, salute, pledge. We're going to start our work on the human body. You remember how we talked about that our body is a living temple. And it is a gift from God. And it's a gift that we want to take care of. Boys and girls, something that is very important for you to learn is to respect and to take care of that body. Fornication. And that word is used in the Bible but also means illicit sex. 1 Corinthians 6.13, sex is not meant to be outside of marriage, then it's sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6.18, we are to flee from sexual immorality. Sexual sins are against our own body. 1 Corinthians 10.8, not commit sexual immorality. Galatians 5.19, sexual immorality is impurity. Ephesians 5.3, sexual immorality hence of sins of other sort. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, Avoid sexual immorality. Exodus 22:19. Anyone who has sexual relations outside of marriage is sinning. A pilgrim is a person who came from another land to worship God in their own way. That is a pilgrim. And America is a very special, very special land because America is founded on religious freedom. People came to America to worship God the way they wanted. Isn't that wonderful? They didn't come to find gold or silver. The pilgrims came to America for religious freedom. The universe, life, and everything in the universe was created in six literal 24-hour days. Then as we studied Genesis chapter 5, we found there was a genealogy there which listed the names of the different people as well as their ages. And we added up from Adam to Noah and found there was only a thousand years. And we're going to see that from Noah to Abraham was also a thousand years. We also know that Abraham lived about 2000 BC. That means that the creation itself would have been about 4000 BC or 6000 years ago. It's very clear that man came into existence only thousands of years ago, not millions, as evolutionists would say. Our session today deals with the physical presentation of the preacher in the pulpit. How should a preacher dress? Let me make some suggestions to you. The most basic suit for a preacher would be a solid navy blue suit. At the pinnacle of this educational establishment is the Criswell College, which grooms more graduates for the ministry than any other university or college within the 15 million strong Southern Baptist community. And then your solid blues, as far as ties are concerned, you could go with stripes, or you want to go with the small patterns, you don't want to go with the large pattern. Let me suggest one book that was a number one bestseller about 10 years ago here, a dress for Success by John Malloy. College President, Dr. Patterson. We became a little bit weary of the suggestion of many of the people who are a part of the intelligentsia of university life that, that fundamentalists were country bumpkins who just rode into town on a load of turnips. Uh, and so we became determined to do our homework, to do our research thoroughly, to be able to speak as uh, adroitly as possible to the issues of the day uh, to see... As the guru of this educational establishment, Dr. Patterson is regarded as one of the principal strategists behind the re-emergence of fundamentalism in America. But his ambitions are not limited to his own country. Graduates from this college are sent out to missionize the world. We have been very much involved in, in similar conservative resurgences that are now going on in Australia, for example, in South Africa, in uh, uh, Germany, in West Germany, and uh, other places also. And uh, many have come to us and said, would you help us? Would you share with us the principles by which you have operated and let us see what may be applicable to our own situation? So the work you do here at First Baptist Dallas has worldwide relevance? Yes, even to the point, as you probably know, that we have a, a, a shortwave radio station that broadcasts four hours a day right from here across all of Europe and right straight up to the doors of Moscow.
music from the praise strings on Sunshine Radio, closing out the hour with the song Praise to the Lord. You're listening to KCBI FM Dallas. Up next, the program First Love with Dr. W.A. Criswell. I'd like to leave the externals for a moment and come to some of the central principles of your faith. Would you describe to me what you mean by the born-again experience? We believe at the moment of conversion, at the moment of new birth, that the Spirit of God comes to live and dwell in a man's life, in a man's heart. A very famous fundamentalist preacher said that Mother Teresa's good works in Calcutta, that lifetime of dedication to the poor, was utterly irrelevant to her salvation. I think almost every fundamentalist in the world would absolutely concur with that statement. So you believe that Mother Teresa, in spite of her good works, is damned to hell unless she can testify to a born-again experience? Unless there has been a time in Mother Teresa's life when she did come face to face with her own sin and acknowledged her inability to do anything about it and asked the Lord Christ to become her Savior and Lord, then yes, she would be condemned in spite of works. But you, Dr. Page Patterson, are guaranteed a place in heaven regardless of what sins you may commit between now and the day you die. There is probably nothing in this world for which I'm any more grateful than that wonderful assurance. I left the Criswell College in connection with a forced resignation. The president told me I must resign or be terminated. He told me this. Dr. Robert Williams was the lecturer with the highest qualifications in New Testament theology at the Criswell College. He was forced out after submitting a paper which suggested that the rich had a responsibility to the poor. Thank you, Father, for the food and for your care for us. We pray that you'll guide us in all that we do today. Such is Dr. Patterson's power in these circles that no other conservative Christian college or seminary has been prepared to employ Dr. Williams. Fundamentalists, as he has learned to his cost, are only prepared to accept the literal truth of some of the Bible. If we, we meaning conservative Christians, profess to believe everything in the whole Bible, then we must submit to all of it. What we find most troubling, though, is showing social concern for other people. It is clear that that was very much on Jesus' heart. It's the message of the prophets in the Old Testament. It's the message of Jesus, Paul, James, the New Testament. That's one reason that we don't study the Gospels more. We tend to study the Epistles more. Because on every page, it seems like Jesus is either helping someone in a way that we don't customarily do, or he's challenging his followers to help someone. Uh, that's difficult material. Why do you think that fundamentalists like Dr. Criswell choose to turn a blind eye to whole areas of the Bible? There's a lot of people out there in the congregation that are coming to his church because they can feel comfortable. They can feel like there's a kind of Christianity that makes their politics make sense that makes their economic success make sense. What you're likely to do with your eyes focused on that is to say, well, maybe for the benefit of this audience, we should stop emphasizing certain things that sometimes we've emphasized in the past. You try that and you find, lo and behold, it does keep your numbers going up and up, maybe even faster. And of course, I'm talking about Concern for those below us. Dallas, the buckle on the Bible belt. We came here to discover what kind of world the Christian right was building in America. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Pastor, pray for me because I know if I were to die this very day, I'd wake up in the burning pits of hell. 
Less than one third of one percent of the vast resources of Criswell's First Baptist is devoted to this work amongst the destitute of Dallas. Would you come and take me by the hand? If you did it, come on and stand by me right here. In this brand of Christianity, does the zeal to save souls for the life to come override every obligation to God's people here on earth? We're buried with Christ in baptism in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in a new way of life. Those fundamentalists who are closest to that question are starting to have their doubts. Every time I leave here, I leave thinking about the people. Some will just sleep on sidewalks, some parks, some in freight train boxcars, some underneath bridges, some in the warehouses. It must be hard to turn these people out into the streets and lock the doors, knowing that they've got nowhere to go. Sometimes you, you, you go home and you just... Was there more I could do? You know, that's why I get up every morning early and I pray. God, give me the wisdom to help every one of them. Because, see, they're important to God. They're important to God. And give me the wisdom to help every one of them I can. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's a difficult thing to explain because it's like a job undone in a way. But yet you know that, that you're, you know, you're doing what God's called you to do to the best of your ability through the power of this Holy Spirit. You're doing what God's called you to do. Produced by Anthony Thomas and Central Independent Television, which is solely responsible for its content. And you'll be able to visit the world of televangelists and fundamentalist religion on the Kingdom Come when it's shown again Tuesday evening at 11 o'clock. Next tonight, the producer and some of the ministers get together to hash over the program, and that'll be on Channel 9 starting in about two minutes this evening, a half hour follow up discussion. Followed by Ed Asner's program about Passover and its ceremony. And then David Copperfield, as the young boy continues to grow up in London. That'll be this evening. Well, we have a telephone answering machine set up at this hour. To take your comments about the kingdom come, please call.